Hi guys and welcome to another Face Hammer Old World show. In this show I'm going to be talking about how to write an effective army list. So I'll be focusing less on the rules of how you make an army list because that's kind of clearly laid out in the books and we've talked about it on the Armanac show. Um, and obviously you will learn that because I'm going to do a live example of me writing a Chaos uh, um, Warriors of Chaos army list. Now um, I want to, before I get into that, is just talk about what I mean by effective. So I'm going to put up some slides and talk about some stuff. So I'll caveat this whole thing with this is kind of my opinion and this is how I go about writing lists. I'm not saying this list is going to be the best list. I'm not going to say some of the choices I make can't be better because um, I've not done any testing. I've not done any playing. So this is my initial stab at Warriors of Chaos List using the collection of models I own and some of the things that I think is cool. Now, when I talk about effective army list writing, I'll talk about some core principles that you can try and apply to your armies. That necessarily won't always apply to the faction. So for example, Chaos don't really have shooting. So, and you could say, yes, they can have thrown axes or yes, they can ally or yes, they can have a hell cannon. I personally, will be going down the more combat route because that's kind of how I I have my collection of warriors. It's more it's more combat focused. I do have access to a hell cannon, um, but I'm not going to be including one in this list, I don't think. So anyway, um, so this show is going to talk about those principles and the the things you need to do to write an effective army list. Now, I know that you sort of effective and not competitive or the best. But if you apply these principles, you should have a strong army list. And then some of the most joy in this game, and one of the reasons that I'm looking forward to it being here and us playing, is army list writing. Now, army list writing is your chance to prioritise what you think is important, come up with character combinations, think about how the army will play on the table, think about what you're facing in your local club or meta or what's good on the tournament scene and how you're going to counteract that and what things you know you can do. And as you face new challenges, you might come up with new solutions and tweaks to your army. And that really is that journey of discovery um, with the game. And I, I really enjoy that process. So that's kind of where I'm coming at with this show. Um, I'm also going to use the Old World Builder website, which I'll put a link below that Jack Armstrong told me about on the weekends. Thank you, Jack. Um, I'm not, I don't know who's behind it. I, I don't know. I've just found it, so I'm using it. Um, but thank you very much for doing it, whoever it is. Great. If you want me to shout anything out, let me know. Just contact me. You can put a comment or whatever. So let's get into the show then. So I'm going to start off with these main principles of Arminist Design. So what makes an effective army list? Again, this is my opinion, what I think, you can disagree. So first thing, really, and this might be obvious if you've played in the past, but maybe you don't know, but winning in Old World comes down to killing more things than you lose. That doesn't mean number of models, although there is a scenario where that is important. This is more kill more victory points worth of models than you lose. So to win the game, you're going to have to kill more than you lose. That's that's basically fundamentally where it is. There are other ways to get victory points. That might be the scenarios, control the middle, control the objectives. Um, and if a different scenario or a different way of playing, if you're playing like a historical reenactment battle or a one-off scenario or some house rules, this will change how you write an army list. Now, because different things will become important. So, for example, having units that you throw away to get positional advantage have a cost, not just because you take away from units in your army that can do things like kill, but actually they give your opponent points. So it's a balancing act of, do you need two screens that you throw away? But everything you put in that you throw away, keep as cheap as possible because they're points you need to get back. Um, so that's fundamentally how you win. And obviously giving up banners cost points, your general dying cost points. So protecting your general, not putting command group unnecessarily on units. So if you've got a unit that's designed to die, don't give them a banner, you know, because the banner doesn't really help you. You're not, you're not using them for combat. You're not trying to win fights. So don't put that banner on your light cavalry. 
They don't need it. It doesn't do anything other than give your opponent more points when they capture it. So don't put it on the on the unit. It's not. It's optional. You know, you don't have to. It's not like AOS where you just put models in for the sake of it. They have no cost. This does have a cost. One, it costs you extra points, and two, it gives them more points. At, not only because it the unit costs more, but also because they capture the banner and score points. So victory points are explained on page two eight six of the main rules, and they have something called dead or fled. So basically, if your unit is off the battlefield because it's run away or is completely destroyed, they get 100% of its points cost as victory points. Now, each enemy unit that's fleeing is worth a number of victory points up to half its points rounding up. So if it's a 351 point unit, it'd be worth 176 points. Um, if it's fleeing when the battle ends. Then also, each unit that's been reduced to less than 25% of its unit strength, and that's unit strength, not models, um, at the end of the battle is worth a number of victory points equal to 25% of its cost, rounding factions up. One, you'd have to get a unit of five cavalry down to a single model to score those points. Um, obviously, if it's destroyed, you'd get all the points, and if it's running away, you'd get half its points. So it's quite an important thing to know that sometimes having a lone model that's rallied, running it round terrain or hiding it is, is a good thing to do because that model might be worth, you know, 75, it's where it's worth 75% of whatever the unit cost was. So if it's a hundred point unit, that's worth 75 VPs just to keep that model alive. And conversely, if you're playing against that, it's worth that for you to kill it. So sometimes, Having stuff that can move and shoot or do damage at range or can catch these things is very important. That's why traditionally like undead kind of struggled a bit or like combat armies because they couldn't capture these like evasive troops. Um, so effectively, when we talk about our army list, we're going to be thinking about ways to get points and protect our points. And that's generally how we're going to approach it. The general's worth 100. So if the general is slain or is fled, he's worth 100. So again, a strong general that doesn't die or is hard to kill. But conversely, if you put a lot of points into like a dragon chaos lord who's hard to kill, if he dies, he's worth a shed load of points for your opponent. So they're going to be going hell for leather to kill him. So you better hope you don't just go offense and don't put any defense on the guy. Fortunately, the list I'll be writing today will have a very defensive Chaos Lord, because I think that's awesome. Trophies of War, so you get 50 VPs for an enemy standard. And additionally, if the battle standard has fled or dead or is fleeing, you get an extra 50. Um... So you can claim standards as a trophy on as described on page 200. I wasn't going to do this, but I think it's quite important to understand. Uh, and this is the sort of thing you need to bear in mind when you write an army list. It's how do I win the game? And that's basically what your list is doing. It's a toolbox of things to give you the tools to win the game. So essentially, trophies of war are claimed um, in the following ways. Um, if a fleeing unit's run down or if a unit is destroyed in combat. So if you're playing um, death, you don't run away, but your units crumble in combat. So if your units are have a banner and they get into a fight and they lose that fight, they lose their banner. So you're, you're giving up banners. So you've got to be quite careful where you put your banners. And um, I'll talk about where to put those. Um, when I do the Toon King show, they're, they're a little bit different to other armies. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how they work and stuff because some of the principles don't apply to them and they, other things apply that don't apply to other factions. So you gotta be a bit careful. Um, there are scenario objectives. So sometimes there's objectives. So if you know, and this is, this is important if you're going into like a tournament and you know what scenarios are gonna be, if they're just playing pitch battle across the board, then you'd have to worry about these bonus points. But say, for example, they're playing different missions and you're playing, uh, you know, there's one where you've got to get below a unit, certain unit strength. You might want to include units which have high unit strength um, and low cost to bulk that out or, or, or units that you don't even use. You just, you just sit around and protect. Um, and also things like table quarters. It might be a thing or, or capture the middle. Um, 
So you just need to understand the victory conditions. If it's going to be pitch battle across the board, then you're really thinking about how do I kill and how do I not give up points? And that's why armies that are evasive and shooting are quite strong. So things like Wood Elves would be quite good at this. But on the flip side of that, they also um, struggle a little bit because they don't have the combat power to claim hard to get points um, and they give up points during the game because you can't avoid forever. Score more points than you lose or build a list for success. So how do you do that? So you need tools to deal with your opponent's threats. So your opponents will have things that you might struggle with or you don't like, whether that's long range shooting, war machines to target your characters, whatever it is, or their lance, their big lance of grail knights. How do you deal with it? You need to have things in your list to deal with it. And that might be an eagle to redirect the charge for two turns of the game, putting them out of position and you don't have to fight them. That might be a way, for example, to heroic kill and blow a character on a dragon. That might be a way of uh, having an ambusher that can take out the war machines. That might be um, a way to put your wizard or your character in a way that the war machines can't shoot you. Um, or very, very unlikely they're going to shoot you. It, you know, these things. So there's different ways to deal with the opponent's threats. Now, you need to protect your key pieces. However, that might be magic items. That might be units you include that aren't going to be in the front line that you can hide around or put in. Or it might be redirectors to stop your main your main hammer unit getting charged or countercharged or anything like that or to protect your chariots you might have your chariot runners so this is all the ways to dictate the game so what you want to do and and people will laugh at this but control the space so you want to control the board space the board state of where stuff is and what you can get in and where you go whether what angle they're at what angle you're at whether they can charge you in the flank or not that is all to do with controlling the board. And that means you need to be pay attention to your arcs of sight, your, your flanks, ranks, um, your flanks and rears, um, your redirectors, the terrain as well is important. You can't dictate that in your army list, but when you play the game, you might need to adapt your play style. Um, deployment is very important in Old World, especially if you're playing Tomb Kings, because they can't march. Your, your ability to reposition after deployment is very limited so make sure you have ways of controlling the pace of the game whether you want to slow people up with redirectors uh because you want to maximize your shooting over four or five turns or you've got ways to hold up one particular scary unit while you deal with other threats and you reposition or you've got anvil units which can hold charges and you've got units designed to get around the sides and win the flank battle to then eventually go into the back of their units and your your hammer and anvil strategy pulls off some of this stuff you can apply from ancient warfare um you know so things like skirmish screens and you know flank attack um cavalry and sort of your tank and spank um is is all kind of classic stuff once the battle lines are drawn and and we we mentioned it we talked about the faq where if a unit can't give ground because there's a model behind it then it doesn't move so you could use units to stop your units giving up ground so you can keep the rears and arcs exactly where they are and if you know that then your positioning can be easier to achieve um using things like it came from below uh, with Tomb Kings, able to pop a unit up that can disrupt um, once you've held them in place. And with um, Undead, you can hold people in place quite easily. Or taking things like the Banner, which means that you automatically become stubborn on your first one and you just fall back in good order. And then maybe you've got a Shield Wall unit that allows you to just give ground. Um, or instead, uh, I think that might be even another rule. And then Shield Wall, which means you don't... Uh, give ground because you've you've got shield wall, so it kind of com compounds. So you need to look at that and how do you can how you can use that to your advantage. Another thing is redundancy to ink to give you backup and duplication. So you might say, for example, in your army, I need a unit of archers to protect my lich priest. Why not take two? Because if one unit of archers gets shot off, and your lich priest is suddenly there with his. Uh, his bits hanging in the wind, then he can run behind the other unit or join the other unit. You might decide that, you know, you having MSU or many small units of bunkers. So rather than have one big unit of 30 archers, 
with a wizard in it, why don't you have three instead of ten and your wizard give him the cloak of the dunes and he can fly around behind them or just have him on foot so he can join the units as he sees fit. Um, obviously, like all this stuff is to taste um, and also redundancy might mean that you have rather than take one chariot, which job is to go in the flank, is have three chariots and they all go up the same flank. Dealing with three chariots and dealing with one chariot is a very different question for your opponent. And I think really that's when you get into the game and you start getting into tactics. Probably the simplest way, it's a bit like playing poker. You need to manage the risk and, and, and the odds. And so you need to make decisions which stack the odds in your favor, whether that's through the amount of static combat rays you have, the buffs you put on, what magic items you've put on in terms of um, mitigating things that are causing you issues. You know, so for example, you might decide to put a thing on your Chaos Lord, which makes everyone else strike last, unless they've got strike first, and then they go to initiative. So therefore, you're very unlikely to get hit by an elven hero with a killing blow weapon uh, before you get a chance to spunk them. And if that's the case, then really it's can you kill them before they kill you? And so if you make yourself quite an aggressive um, Chaos Lord, then they probably won't. And then there you go, you've achieved something. So redundancy and backup um, is a good thing in this because you basically have your opponent then has two things they need to deal with rather than one or three things or four things. Obviously, that means the more points you pour into a certain area, you have less on other areas. So if you pour lots of points into war machines, you've got less points for your anvils to stop people getting to your war machines or to redirect. So Again, it's a balancing act and you need to make the decisions of what you prioritize and that'll be down to your taste and your play style. There's not really a right and wrong. I think you might have a situation where you go, in this situation, I would have been better off having more redirectors. Whereas in another situation, you said, I could have done with two more war machines and that would have been more effective. And it really does depend what you're going to face. And I would say, try and build an all-rounder list, a list that does a bit of everything. Uh, and has aspects of these different areas, which I'm about to go into, and that's going to be Battlefield Roles. Now, Battlefield Roles is not a game term. I'm not telling you that they have these. It's not a, a rule. It's my interpretation of what a unit is doing in the army going forward. So a bunker unit is like a unit that is designed to protect a character. Um, so that might be a unit of archers or something that your character can either hide in or around, or it might be, you know, MSU style, small units of cavalry that your, your character can run between. So basically the bunkers function is primarily protection. Now, what I will say about these is that you can have a unit that does multiple things and can be flexible and they become more valuable. Um, obviously the more roles you're trying to do with one unit, the more important that is in your army. So, you know, you, you might have a bunker unit that's also range removal because your wizard is designed to do range damage and the bunker unit is archers, for example. So I've got these here. So like chaff or a screen and charge blockers and redirectors. And I put these two separate, but they're kind of linked most of the units that fall into here will also fall into here and that's because a charge blocker is generally a screen um, and might be a unit you want to get away but a screen or a chaff unit is more to do with blocking shooting um, and you know charge blockers redirectors are more about blocking combat now you might have a unit that is good at one and not at the other or a unit that might be good at both so um, you know for example you got a unit of skirmishers, uh, which block line of sight. You can use them to screen your chariots, who can, um, you know, shoot through because they can see through, but they can't shoot the chariots. So you might use like archers on chariots, uh, and your your screens there to protect from shooting, or it might be the case that you want to um, block charges to your chariots with the same unit, and you behave slightly differently. So effectively. What you want is some units that are going to be there to block a charge or redirect a charge. Now, um, that means that you hold the charge and the overrun and they go in a weird direction. Now, there are a few um, changes in this addition. So one of them is that when you run someone down, you can actually reform. So 
this is a lot harder to achieve now because they can charge your thing and kill it and then reform. And if you run away and they catch you, they can reform. Um, so you need something that can either hold a charge completely and hope it survives or can, um, you know, run away. They they chase you and you run far enough that they don't catch you. Um, so it is a little bit risky, uh, but it does stop them charging your main blocks. So your this, this will be something like an eagle from the high elf army. So it just flies over, wheels slightly, puts an angle that when they align to you, their angle is a bit weird. Um, you know, they kill you. They either re reform where they are and let the and after they've killed the eagle, or they uh, overrun and do the same. So that's kind of you know. So it's not. I don't think it's as effective this edition as it used to be, but it's still there. So the other thing you can do is just flee or use a reaction. Um, but again, if they catch you, they can reform. So there is a test involved. So it's not guaranteed. So we'll see. But yeah, so the idea here is to try and you all want to get the charge. So you're trying to get a favorable charge. Obviously, as well, another change this edition is that things like cavalry can counter charge. So if you're trying to line up a charge with your cavalry, they can counter charge against cavalry and monsters. So it's kind of harder to do. Um, and there's a little bit more risk involved. It's not as guaranteed, which I kind of like. Um, you might have units which are good at ranged removal. So what they are, they're like, um, you know, your shooting units, your skirmishes, stuff that can just chip damage off. And these are good for removing chaff screen and charge blockers redirectors so you can get the charges and they can't block you um so for example if you're playing against someone who's got chariot runners protecting their chariots you can shoot the chariot runners off and then the chariots are not protected anymore um so range removal is really important this may not be missile weapons this could be um war machines and it could also be breath weapons and it could also be spells or ruby ring that kind of thing so range removal is a little bit different and then i haven't put magic in here but essentially you might want an anti-magic um like model so that protects you or magic res to protect you from things like range removal or um to make your um anvil or hammer hit hard or your anvil be more resilient so I'll talk about magic's kind of its own thing. And really what you're doing with magic is you're having a support role, which is probably one of the ones I should list here. And what that does is that, I mean, counters kind of is, is magic as well, because a lot of the spells will help counter their strengths by buffing you or debuffing them or removing them or, you know, stopping their spells, etc. cetera. So um, then I've got anvils. So a bit, bit sort of, as you'd expect, an anvil is a unit that can hold a charge. Um, and the idea is then a hammer unit will come in and smash the unit on your anvil. So the idea is that your anvil unit holds the enemy up, doesn't die, holds its ground, and gives you time for your hammers to get in. So there's there's a bit of play around the sides, especially in the old world, because units stick around a bit longer than they used to do. It was quite common for units to get charged and run down straight away. But now the only way you run down completely is to roll above your leadership. And what you'll do is generally pushing people back and your battle lines kind of shift. And um, there are ways to stop you being pushed back. You can put a unit behind, for example, so you can't be pushed back. But obviously there's a risk there because if you run away, you cause panic if you go through the unit and if they chase you, they can overrun into it. So that has its dangers as well. Um, but, you know, these kind of things, and they're also like you can be stubborn, which means you fall back in good order. So like a unit with um, shield wall special rule could take the banner, which um, the iron resolve banner, which means that it doesn't, it fall backs in good order the first time it takes a break test and then the shield wall rule means you just give ground rather than fall back in good order and then you could place a unit behind to guarantee that your unit doesn't move backwards and that they they don't you know they, they basically stay exactly where they are so that could be a way of playing to set up a flank um so really that's that's kind of what an anvil's job is it's to take the charge now obviously 
units that are effective at this might be high damage units with high initiative like sword masters so they charge you but you still go first it could be units that are very defensive like you know nurgle chaos warriors for example it could be a unit that is um just numerous uh, like a big unit of 50 skeletons you know the amount of damage they would need to do to break through that many wounds is is kind of ridiculous so they don't run away anything that's unbreakable um or, or unstable and has good defense or good static combat res so your anvil unit could for example be a horde unit with a battle standard with the war banner so you're in like two banners war banner then you've got close order so that's another one so that's four plus three ranks um because you've got horde and then you know so you're, you're up to you're up to seven already i mean you can create these static res blocks which don't really run away very often uh because they don't lose the combat by much um if at all so um that's another way you could also have a champion that's defensive that can challenge out a hero um you can also have a wizard that buffs the units one important thing is that wizards now if they refuse a challenge have to go to the back and they all the buff will fall off the unit so you need to be a little bit wary of that um now hammers is kind of your opposite these are the units that will hit the things these are your like your smash units the units that do the damage this could be a character on a dragon it could be a heavy chariot because they've got unit strength five why is that important because unit strength 10 is required to disrupt when you disrupt you take their rank bonus away they're more likely to fall back if you have these things and once a unit falls back and you start pushing them towards the table edges that's a way of pushing off the table if not running them down if they if they break and flee correct uh, completely um so modifiers to leadership are quite big for this because obviously like it's all based on your static leadership so if you can modify that that's pretty important um then you've got um so hammers like it could be cavalry it could be characters on mounts it could be chariots it could be a block of infantry i mean it doesn't matter as long as it can counter charge or get into position um generally things like cavalry and chariots and monsters are better because they move faster and you need to be able to maneuver into the areas to counter um it could also be ambushes like units that come from beneath the sands or whatever the rules called now and then counters these are units which can um, basically um, interrupt or disrupt or counteract your enemy stuff. So, for example, if you're playing against Tomb Kings and you've got flaming attacks, that counts their regen save, so that makes it more likely to lose combats. Um, well, regen save counts anyway, but you know what I mean. It, it means more models die. So, um, for me, like counters is things like anti-magic, magic resistance dispel scrolls you know um things that affect people if they miscast that kind of thing it could also be um magic items which you know affect things or spells which can uh, affect things on the tabletop um as simple things as like generating something that blocks like movement um so counters are kind of like anything that will help um blunt the enemy's hammer or reduce their anvil's effectiveness or um you know make their range removal less effective or remove chaff screen blockers redirectors so basically what you're what you're trying to do is kill more points than you give up and you want to use your toolbox of units to uh dictate the game and that's really by assigning a kind of a battlefield role to what you pick that's kind of what I mean. So let me run you through an example of me writing a Chaos Warriors army list. So this is the Old World Builder app army builder. I'll put a link in the description so you can click on it uh, and use it yourself. Um, so it does say it's beta, so there might be some things that are incorrect. We'll give it a name, um, Warriors of Chaos. So that's my faction. So. Click on create list and it gives me this. It says that I must have a thousand points up to 500 points missing. So because of the percentages and let me let me show you the um, this is the muster list for Warriors of Chaos. So you have naught to one Chaos Lord or Demon print. So there's a choice right away there. Naught to one Exalted Champion or Sorcerer Lord per thousand. So I could have one of each. 
Um, aspiring champions and exalted sorcerers. So I can only have two exalted champions or sorcerer lords. I can only have one lord or demon prince. I can have as many of these as I want, but only 50% up to it. That's how a muster list works. Um, core, I must have 25% of my points spent on warriors, marauders, forsaken, knights, marauder, horsemen, and warhounds. Now special, I can have up to one unit of uh, chosen Chaos Warriors, one unit of chosen Chaos Knights, and I can have Ogres, Trolls, Spawn, Chariots, and Chimeras, and Dragon Ogres. Rare is Gore Beast Chariots, 0 to 1 Hell Cannon, 0 to 1 Dragon Ogre Shagoth, um, 0 to 1 Chaos Giant, and I can have 20% on Mercenaries, but we don't really know what Mercenaries are right now. Allies, so I could take from Organ Goblin, Beastmen, or Tomb Kings. Um, I think effective warriors this might use beastmen allies quite a bit. I'm going to stay away from allies and mercenaries. I'm just going to stick within the core list. And I'm actually not going to take any rare. I still don't really want a hell cannon in my list. I don't think it really suits what I'm doing. Um, so I'm literally not touching this bit of the muster list. I am just focusing here. And I will tell you now I'm going to max this out and be actually struggle to get everything I want. I'm going to minimize core and the rest is going to be on special and I'm going to focus on my model collection, the models I think are cool and that's going to be armored cool chaos warriors basically. Battle standard, so I can have a battle standard, I think it's important to have a battle standard because the re-rolls on break tests is really important. Um, it also gives you a way of comboing magic banners in a unit so I will be taking a BSB. So that's the muster list. Let's go back to the army builder. There will be a bit of flipping around on the show. Um, so let's start off with core. Now with my core, I want a block, an anvil of Chaos Warriors. I'm also going to put my... I'm not going to touch... I'm not going to have normal Chaos Knights. I don't think Chaos Knights that aren't chosen are... I think that... You mean that 100 points is pretty cheap for what they are, but I don't really want normal Knights. I just want a big unit of chosen. So I'm going to go Chaos Warriors. I've got Marauder Horse. And I've got Warhounds. Now, Warhounds are interesting. Now, if I go on to Warhounds, they're 30 points, right? They they move through cover. They've got Open Order and Swift Droid. So they're quite quick. And I can give them Vanguard. Okay, so that makes them quite good as a screen. So I, I quite like them. So let's put a unit of these in. Okay. So I just want five of them. Um, and I'm not going to give them a handler. I'm not going to give them any armor save. I don't see the point. I don't want poison attacks. I want to keep the unit as cheap as I possibly can. Now, the only issue with Chaos Hound, Warhounds, is they are they do cause panic because they still they still cause panic in your army, which is a bit annoying. Um. But there you go. I think it doesn't tell me their unit type, but I believe these are war beasts. So, um, and then I will have a, I will duplicate them. So I've got these two units. So I've got 70 points of my core fulfilled. Now, I also want to take Marauder Horsemen. Now, Marauder Horsemen are multi role. So these are fast cavalry, they have fire and flee. Um, they are open orders going to this Swiss, Swiss stride and they've got war bands. So they've got quite a lot of special rules. They can have marks. So um, they come with light armor. I always used to give mine flails and throwing axes because that's what I've modeled them with. I don't necessarily think that's the best option now that they've there's these new cavalry spears and, you know, you can have that in javelins or, you know. But I'm just going to go with what the models have so flails and throwing axes i'm not going to give them shields for one my models don't have them and two again they're not there to stick around um in the old days the reason they didn't have shields is because they'd lose the fast cavalry rule and they'd end up with a four up armor save now it's probably worth giving them a five up save over a six up save for their light armor so you could give them shields so it's it's entirely up to you um, again, it's five points, um, and it doubles your odds of saving. So I probably will take shields, actually. I'll have to paint some and stick them on my models. So 
In terms of command group, um, do I want a champion, a standard bearer, or musician? I'm not going to give them command because standard bearers are kind of bad because what happens is you see, they give the banner up. You might take a musician to allow you to rally. Now, because they have fire and flee, um, then they might be running away quite a lot. They have the mark of undivided, so you could give them a mark. I'm not going to give them a mark. You could give them a mark of corn, but that would make them frenzied. And that means that their idea of them standing in front of things and redirecting and fire and fleeing, that's completely gone out the window because they're going to be charging and going rah, rah, rah and overrunning. So I don't really want mark of corn. Mark of Nurgle's good if they're going to be fighting combat. I'm not going to be fighting combat. Uh, mark of Sinesh makes me immune to panic. Yeah, fine. Marker's Inch might be useful. So let's just remind ourselves what the marks do. Um, if you're watching this going, I don't know what these marks do. So let's do that. So um, let's look at... So Marks of Chaos, Undivided, Reroll, Fear, Panic, or Terror. So that's actually quite good for what I'm doing with these guys. Marker Corn, Frenzy, don't want that. Marker Nurgle, Enemy directs his attack, Reroll, Hitch, Natural Roll of a Six. Doesn't help me. Models with Marcus says, plus one initiative, not bad. Um, also, additionally, if the majority of the models have the mark of Sinesh, they automatically pass panic tests. So I could automatic pass, or I could have a reroll. I'm going to keep the reroll because the problem with this is I don't get the fear um, and terror bit here, um, and this costs more points. Mark of Zinch gives me magic resistance flaming attacks um it does say if a wizard joins um unit strength 10 or more they apply plus one to casting which might be useful because my um my unit um if i went zinch across the board like it, they have a unit strength of 10 so if you've got a, a wizard on a horse they could run into this unit and join it um to get the bonus for their shooting attack and it protects them so that's not necessarily a bad choice. Again, I'm not going to. I'm just going to stick with um, with my um, with, with my initial assessment, which is going to be no mark. So that's basically what they're going to have. I'm not going to go with command yet. Let's just see. So I'm going to. I'm then going to duplicate these because I want two of them. So I've got 280 points left. Okay. I've got two screens with Vanguard and I've got two what I would call uh, redirectors or and these could double up as units that charge them later on and they do have some range removal. So they're kind of a little bit of everything, but obviously you're not really going to remove units with throwing axes. It's just a little bit of chip damage. It does give you a way to hunt down lone models. That, that are hiding that are worth points so these units are quite important so you don't really want to throw them away that's why the warhounds become a bit more attractive now if i add this up total you can see that i've basically got 220 points of what i would call stuff that's probably going to die so in my game if i only lose this i need to get more than 220 points i've still got to have a core unit so I'm going to add a unit of Chaos Warriors. Now, these are heavy infantry. Um, I'm going to give them uh, shields. Now, these come with heavy armor and don't get a ward save because they're not chosen. Okay, They will have full command because um, I want to make sure they have the static res. I want to be able to challenge out characters. And I want the musician to win on a draw and also for rallying if they do run away. So basically, I'm going full on these. I've got 280 points to spend anyway. These are only 88. Now, I've got five in a unit. I want at least, I would say, two to three ranks. They only need to be four wide. So I could go for a unit of 16. Not 19. 16. And say I'm at 242. That gives me some points left over. Now, I'm going to mark them. Now, I think the best mark is Nurgle for an anvil because that protects them in combat. Um, so I'm going to go with Mark and Nurgle. Now, you notice here I'm still under my points limit. 
okay i've got 16 in the unit now the reason i've went with 16 is i'm probably going to have two characters in this unit on a barded steed that'll make it a unit of 20 but if i don't have a character in it i'm still gonna and i want to be five wide because i have to put the command in the front rank so if i'm four wide i can only join one character in and then this becomes uh, one character's not in the fighting rank so I need to be at least five wide. So 16, and they're on 30 mil bases, and the cavalry mounts I'm taking are on 30 by 60. They will take up four spots. I don't want to be four by five because then I'm in marching column and I'm not in combat order. However, if both characters leave this unit and join, say, for example, my knight unit, then these are going to be four by four and have the max res and some an extra rank just in case. They have, um, you know, close order in sorcered weapons, mark of chaos undivided, which I'm replacing with mark of Nurgle. So they don't have many special rules. Now, one of the things I really want on this unit is a way for them not to run away. So I I think really it's a magic standard. Now, I could take the Banner of Iron Resolve, which seems really good. But because I don't have Shield Wall, if I break from combat, the first time I take a test, I don't roll dice. I just automatically fall back in good order. I don't really want to fall back. I want to hold the charge, so I'm going to risk it. Um, and I think what I want is I want to give myself more static combat res, so I'm going to go for the War Banner. It's also cheaper. Um, I could take one of these banners, and some of these are quite good, but I'm just going to go for the war banner. You could have up to 50 points, as you can see here, on the war banner. Um, now, if I go here and I go, that's everything, that's 299 points. So I'm over my minimum core now. I've got 519, okay? I had a choice. A Chaos Lord or a Demon Prince? I like the idea of a Chaos Lord on a dragon. I think the dragon is cool. I think it's very powerful. Um, the Chaos Dragon gives you extra toughness and wounds. You you have full plate armor and you have um, Chaos armor. So you become pretty, pretty gnarly. Oh, that's quite cool. It warns you up there. Um, and again, we look at the marks. I'm definitely going to give him a shield. Um, I, I, I really can't see past the mark of Nurgle. Um, it, it it's just too good. Um, so I'll go with that now. He he has loads of options with gifts and 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 items, right? So in the magic item section, I quite like the bedazzling helm. Now bedazzling helm is um it gives you a pip of armor save so it's gonna be on a two plus it also gives me a um minus one hit which is pretty good because i kind of want my guy to survive it's 60 points out of my 100 points allowance i'm pretty sure it's um so chaos lord he has got um Initiative six, which is amazing. Five attacks, weapon skill seven. It's pretty good. Um, and he's got five up ward save from Chaos Armor. Um, it's got the Gaze of the Gods, uh, Rallying Cry, and so you can give him some weapons. So if he's mounted, he can have a lance. So if I don't, it, in Sword Sword Weapon means you've got magical attacks anyway. Has a ward save against wounds suffered. The armor value of this ward is shown in brackets after the name. So. You know, it's a five-up ward. In Sorcered Weapons, uh, it has magic attacks and armor piercing. He's already got a good strength anyway. You've got the Gaze of the Gods, so you can roll on this table and you could end up with a um, become stupid, which would be bad. You could end up with plus one initiative. You could end up with plus one toughness, which would be amazing. Uh, plus one to your weapon skill plus one to your attacks or plus one to your strength and leadership. He's he's pretty gnarly. So there's also some good magic items in the Chaos Army list. Um, so, and this is the one I'm looking at. It's a talisman, so I can have this with the armor. 
and it's the Crown of Everlasting Conquest, which is a 5-up regen save. So that's going to give me a 2-plus armor, a 5-plus ward, and a 5-plus regen. So that's going to make my, my character also minus 1 to hit in combat, and you're going to have to reroll 6s. All that combined, that's pretty defensive. He should be hard to kill, right? So he's going to be pretty good. So that's pretty cool. And I think that's um, more than happy to go with that. So Chaos Dragon, plus one toughness, plus six wounds. Going to use that. Going to get cool. We've also got Gifts of Chaos. Um, and some of these are amazing. So um, really the ones that I think is... Uh, I mean, Dark Magic is cool. But I don't care about Demon Flesh really because I've got high toughness. Really, it's these two, okay? So there's one that any model that targets this character or a unit they've joined, so there's minus one to hit, or enchanting aura, enemy units engaged cannot use the strike first, and enemy models that do not have strike first become such to strike last. So this is great because this means you are going to go first. So if I play against another dragon or you know like a high off dragon or something else i can just charge it knowing full well that i'm going to go before it and i'm not i don't care they can have they can charge me i'll go first so that makes my dragon really bloody scary it means that i'm not as resilient for shooting but that enchanting aura for me is is almost a must pick um i don't want to get charged by a high initiative character with killing blow on monsters i want to kill them before they swing so this for me is is going to be my go-to um so i'm going to go with that so um yeah let's go so let's go what am i doing with my guy so common magic items we are going with bedazzling helm i am then going to go to enchanted items and go for my um oh, talisman sorry uh a crown of everlasting conquest that's my 100 points gone so I can't spend any more on that. Then I have a another choice, Gifts of Chaos. Now, the Gift of Chaos, I have it at 50 points. So I can take one of these, basically. I am going to take um, Enchantment Aura, which is going to be the one that I said about, which means that I'm going to get to make them go last. So now all I haven't done is the weapon, right? So I'm going to give him a Lance. Now... What this means is that on the charge, I can choose to use the hand weapon anyway, which is in Sword, or I can use the lance. And then once you've used the lance, you switch to the hand weapon, which is in Sword. So I just think it's it's better to have the higher strength, but actually you don't need to use the lance because in Sword weapon is still magic attacks and rend one. So you don't, it, it maybe I don't hit as hard as I could, but I'm kind of relying on the dragon um, and I'm defensive, so I'm kind of going where I'm going to try and kill stuff. You could, for example, swap like the Crown of Everlasting Conquest, or I would probably swap the Bedazzling Helm out for a uh, knowing you're going first for a combat weapon. That's entirely, and I may well do that after some time playing with the list and having some games and going, actually, it's better to have to kill stuff. So, in that case, what magic weapon would I take? Um, I would probably take, let's have a quick look. Uh, can't take these. Could take the dragon slow note. It's going to be 40 points. Spell eater axe is quite good because it gives you the magic resistance. Um, but obviously is fairly expensive. Um, maybe sort of might is the only one, uh, really. Um, and yeah, these aren't very good. So I, I, yeah, I just don't see the point. Um, really the one you want is the giant blade or the uh ogre blade so they're the, the multi-wound ones which are better at killing other creatures or the killing blow but obviously if you have the this one you can't you can't buy the everlasting conquest um so if you bought this one you could and you've still got 30 points left if you drop the bedazzling helm um which could be i don't know you've got a talisman you haven't got armor so you could take something, um, Ruby Ring, maybe, maybe Ruby Ring plus um, 
Yeah, maybe Ruby Ring plus the Giant Blade plus Talisman, um, the Everlasting Conquest. Oh, Ruby Ring is enchanted, right? Uh, and that's the talisman. Yeah, so you could do that. So you could go with that. Uh, how many eyes is cool, but I don't want to be stupid. So favor the gods is nice if you've got the points to split on. Obviously, brazen collar is good as well. Um, that's good for unit champions. I like that on my my army. So there you go. So he come, yeah he comes in at six hundred and thirty one points. So pretty expensive. It only gives me three hundred and sixty points available. I definitely want a wizard. Um, which is going to be an exalted sorcerer. I'm going to give him Mark and Nurgle because he's probably going to end up joining the warriors and I want the signature spell. So I'm going to go Mark and Nurgle. He's going to have a chaos steed. I'm now, if I take my law, let's have a quick look at the laws and I'll tell you why I'm going to choose demology because I like demology, but let's have a look. So I'd like to give Mark Cain familiar. Um, and that gives me the choice of spell. Okay. Um, I could also take the extra spell, so I roll three dice. And that's the Chaos one, which I think is called Spell Familiar, if I'm correct. Uh, and that is Spell Familiar. Yeah, 15. It's the same points. So I could choose an extra spell, or I could choose to pick. Um, I'm kind of leaning to the extra spell, because really the only spell that I really want, okay, is... Um, this one, let me show you. So just as a reminder, these are the spell laws. Okay, this is battle magic. Um, I'm not gonna be taking the signature because I've got Mark and Nurgle. I'm gonna be taking the Nurgle signature. So I'm really looking at these six spells and I'm going, okay, mis magic missile, fine. Curse of arrow attraction is pretty useless for me because I don't have shooting. Uh, Pillar of fire, I'm not a big fan of that. I don't really like vortexes. Um, a conveyance spell, um, it's okay, but I'm not really that bothered about that. Oaken Shield is good. Uh, five up ward, so any unit they've joined, so that's a decent spell. And then Cowardly Flight, so it, it's just not really useful. So really the only two spells in there are Oaken Shield and Fireball. Now that's a 33% of the spells are useful, so I don't think that's good enough for me to go, yeah, I'd definitely go Battle Magic. Like, I don't, it's not, I'm not going to mess around with it. Now, Dark Demology, I'm not going to take the summoning, obviously. Demology means I've got Steed of Shadows, which is Conveyance, um, and it gives them flight. That could be really cool, um, basically, um, on the Chaos Warriors. Um, so, you know, you could actually... Gathering Darkness, um, then minus two to initiative, minus two to its leadership, cannot use Inspire. That's really good. Like that that's just I want to make sure that they they run away or that they're they're going after me. That's always going to be useful. Demonic Familiars is a sailment, um, which is great because I'll probably be in combat with my wizards because he's going to be stood in the front rank on his barded steed with his heavy armor. So he's got a four up armor save and he's got to reroll sixes to hit him. So he's not as weak as you might think. So he might actually be able to stand in the front rank and he needs to stand there for his buff. Also, that helps in a challenge because this FAQ that a sailman hit the model you're in the challenge with. Um, Demonic Vassal. Um, so it's enchantment 10 range self. So they get plus one to strength and attacks, improve their armor pierce by one. That is amazing. That spell is on a 10, so it's quite hard to cast it. But you get to roll this in your hero phase, right? You, in your strategy phase, you just get to roll it. If you roll it, once it's in, because it's a um, remains in play, then basically, um, oh, sorry, until the end of this turn. So if you cast this off and you charge, that you're going to hit really hard. Um, I quite like this spell. It's quite hard to cast it. Vortex of Chaos, um, sure. It's like, take some damage, whatever. Um, and this one here, again, is it's on a nine, but plus one to movement, toughness, initiative. So again, that's pretty good. So there's no direct damage here really other than the vortex but this is good this is good 
this is good this is good this is good so you've got five and even that's okay so you are like all of them are viable so you're gonna have something to do so um i quite like this law um then we've got dark magic again ignore the signature because i'm not swapping to this um so a hex is minus one strength toughness could be useful um it's quite a long range and it means that you're they're going to be less likely to bust your anvil um this is a salmon flame template yeah okay fine infernal gateway <laughs> um so it's friendly characters um move it and replace it within 12 not within six of enemy can leave combat that's okay but i'm not really it's not really what i want to be doing you got phantasmagoria um it causes panic tests uh, and they'll fall back there's quite a lot of disruption and it makes people impetuous i quite like this one i like this control it's on a nine so this one's all right um, you've got Battle Lust, which is um, Frenzy and Hatred until the end of the turn. Again, it could be quite good because you can put on your Chaos Knights, for example, because it's not it enough to be on you. It's just within 12. So that's quite a decent spell. And solely it is an assailment. Um, yeah, it, it's okay. But I mean, Dark Magic for me doesn't really do it either. So I'm going to go Demology. Um, after a few games, I might decide that that was the wrong choice and I should do something else. Um, and again, like because I can pick if I choose that familiar, that's good. So um, the reason, Nurgle, okay, is this spell. So it's cast on a seven, so it's a five or more. Remains in play, so once it's in, it's in. Obviously, they can get rid of it in their go, but not not the easiest this is why it's in play the caster and any unit they've joined get plus one to their toughness to a max of seven so that just makes my anvil harder um also if i cast it i could always like leave and join another unit to put it somewhere else if i want to um so i quite like this spell um and the reason i prefer this over acquiescence is obviously the Nurgle buffs better for my unit anyway, because you can't join Sanesh into Nurgle. You can just join Undivided or um, Nurgle. So it says, until the end of the combat phase, the target enemy unit becomes such a strike last. That's fine. It's only range of 12, and it's a hex. So they have to be within 12 of me at the start of my go, and it only lasts for my go, whereas this is remains in play. So this gives me a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, yes, undivided as a hex, 21 is a long range. It takes their movement away. Uh, pff, sure, it might make their charge a bit harder, but I, I'm not really disappointed in that. Since the other one is a magic missile, and this is quite a good magic missile. So the other option in this list is to pivot the marks to Zinch and just go full Zinch and then having the magic resistance and have this and just rely on the normal toughness resilience and we lose that so um it also gives you pluses to cast which makes casting spells a little easier um so that's the other option and it gives you more range damage so you could go with more wizards uh go for a bit more range fret uh because blue fire is, is a pretty decent spell you know 18 inches d6 plus three strength four hits armor pierce minus two flaming and you'd be getting plus three to that, so you need to roll six. Um, that's pretty good. Obviously, if they've got magic resistance, that that affects this because it's targeting them. And the good thing about fleshy abundance, it targets you, so it doesn't their magic resistance doesn't matter. Um, that's why I like that spell a lot. So um, back to the list. So um, I've got two free eight points. Now I need to get a battle standard. I want an exalted. I'm gonna make him a magic. I'm gonna battle standard. Um, he's gonna be on a chaos steed, not a demonic mount. Um, he's a battle standard bearer. He needs to have the mark of Nurgle. He needs to have a shield. I'm gonna give him a lance. 
Um, and that puts him at 182 points. Now, that does give me, if I come back, 56 points left. And I haven't really done anything with their magic gear. He can have a gift of chaos. Now, I really like the Diabolic Splendor. Now, Diabolic Splendor gives any unit you join minus to hit, okay, with um, shooting. Now, the other thing, obviously, he needs Mark of... Um, he's got the Mark of Noble. Cool. That's his mount. The other thing I could do is give him a Magic Banner. Now, the Magic Banners, I could give him the Blasted Standard, now, this makes him 257 points. Now, you see I'm over points here, so I'm going to come to that in a minute. So, what does this do? Blast the standard. The unit carrying the... We re-roll any rolls of natural one, making armor save rolls against wounds suffered in the shooting phase. That is brilliant as anti-shooting. I like the fact it's on him, and I combine that with my... Tomonic Splendor. Enemy models target this character. Any unit they joined will suffer an additional minus one to hit. So minus one to hit and re-roll save rolls of one. My unit's generally going to have a save of two plus uh, if he's in the Chosen Knights. So that gives me like double shooting protection and that'll depend mostly on the meta of what you're facing if that's useful. Um, the other options for magic banners, I could go with um, the Banner of Rage, but it gives you Frenzy, don't want that. Doom Totem is pretty good. Minus one to leadership if you can see it. Um, which, you know, that's pretty strong uh, because of all the, the things I talked about with that. Um, and this one, ignore all negative modifiers, which is also quite good. Um, I don't know if that means that when you take your break test, you ignore them as well. Um, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. But 75 points is very expensive. Um, so what am I going to do about being over with my characters? I've got 19 points to find. So the obvious one is to get rid of the Arcane Familiar and say, don't need that. Okay, and that puts me four points. So on my Exalted Champion, I don't want to drop anything on my Chaos Lord. On my Exalted Champion, I've got a Lance. I'm going to drop that to a hand weapon. Bish, bash, bosh, I'm bang on, so I'm fine. There you go. So that's my character loadout. I've got a level two, I've got a BSB, and I've got a Chaos Dragon Lord. I've got four units of redirect chaff. I've got one anvil. That's my core. So now we're just going to fill up with special. Now notice I've got 481 points, and that's it. So my special, I really want some Chaos Chariots. I'm not going to mark them just yet, okay? That means I've got just enough points for one hammer unit. And I mentioned it already, it's going to be Chosen Chaos Knights. We're going to go for full command. We're going to give them the Razor Standard, because why not? We're going to give them a Musician. They're going to have lances. They're going to go full plate. They're going to go Mark and Nurgle. And we're going to have six of them. Let's see how much I'm over. 58 points over. So I now need to find some points. So I'm going to drop them down to five. No, not up. Okay. 15 points over. I want to drop one of these things. I can afford to drop some points here. The obvious thing is I could drop the shields on the horsemen and vanguard on the warhounds. That's 15 points. Um, I could also, I could kill a unit of hounds. So I could say, actually, right, let's do it this way. Okay. So I'm going to delete this. Okay. This is now going to put me 1980, okay? And I'm under points here, okay? Now I could, for example, move the banners around between the unit and the character, but obviously I need more I need more core points, 16 points missing. Now, it just so happens 
that a Chaos Warrior is 16 points. So I can add a Chaos Warrior in, and that puts me up to 500, and it gives me four points left over. The other thing I could do is rather than... Actually, this is what I'll do. I can add a magic item to the champion. And actually, what I'm going to add is I'm going to add a 20-point magic item. And I'm going to add the Brazen Collar. What does it gives the unit magic resistance? Um, so that's bang on 2,000 points. That gives them magic resistance too. Um rather than the brazen collar on the start on the champion. I've got the war banner, 16 of those, I've got two units of Mortal Cav, I've got one unit of Warhounds as a Vanguard as a screen. That's only really to protect against um people who can do a Vanguard and then charge you turn one, as it can happen, I think. Two chariots, these are my hammers, five chosen Chaos Knights. My characters can sit in the Chaos Warriors, but they could also join the Chaos Knights, depending on the spell the sorcerer can move around. The Chaos Lord on Dragon can operate kind of independently. Um, so that's my 2,000 point list. Um, like I say, I think it's effective because I've got a couple hammers because these break unit strength, unit strength five, you know, so they disrupt. Um, together, they'll operate on one flank with a unit Marauder Horse for protection. The cavalry will probably operate on another flank. I could double stack a flank with all these, these three of these and anchor my flank with the um, Chaos Warriors and then just have one unit Marauder Horse on that side as protection, the Warhounds to screen the Warriors, um, all the Knights, depending, and then the other Marauder Horse to operate around the Chariots to protect them. Um, so it could be, could be a way of doing it. Chaos Lord on Dragon can operate maybe on the other flank on his own, so you could use that as a refusal to push people, um, or you could be using conjunction with the knights. There's, there's a lot of options. Um, so you could even put the warrior central in chariot either side with the Marauder Horror Cav and the unit, and then the knights and the lord can kind of operate together or independently. So yeah, it, it's okay. I think it's quite a cool list. Um, that's my um, my 2000 point warrior cows list. I don't know if it does it a nice way of showing, showing it um, other than this. Let's see. Export, what's that look like? Uh, so I exported the army list, uh, and as you can see here, this is the export file in Notepad. Um, so it tells you that it's Warriors of Chaos, it's Old World, 1,000 points on characters, exactly. Got my Chaos Lord, all his gear, Exalted Sorcerers, Mark and Nurgle, he's got Demonology. Um, Again, he doesn't really have anything. He's quite in his pants. Exalted Champion. And I, I will play around with these loadouts. So there's stuff here that I might change. It's just that to start with, this I think looks okay. I've got one unit of Vanguard in Chaos Warhounds, which are there to protect my myself. I reduced my easy obtainable points and put more into my anvil. Um, so I basically said, well, these here. And my chariots and... Chaos Knights, so there you go. That's my army, and um, I think that would be a fairly decent list. It does lack a few things, like it doesn't really have any long range threat. You know, like Ruby Ring would help um, taking a magic law that's less about buffing the unit and more about ranged offense. So after a few games, if you're playing a lot of avoidance, they might say that actually I'm going to put Ruby Ring on the Chaos Lord, change, you know, take the helm off. Ruby Ring and the Blade, so that changes his loadout. You can drop the Lance then. That will give you um, a few points, and you might give change this to Mark of Zinch, Mark of Zinch, Mark of Zinch. You'll kind of, kind of keep that with Nurgle, to be honest. And then you change this unit, the base unit, to Mark of Zinch. Then you want Blue Fire on this guy to give you a Magic Missile. Then you know you could take whatever. Um, you could even, uh, so Hell Cannon is 215 points. Um, so could you use that for, instead of the Chariots, um, because, you know, that's fairly decent um, in terms of, like, getting rid of some stuff. I mean, I, I'm not really a massive fan. It's okay, um, but 
yeah, it's like you could take one. Um, I don't really like the leadership test and then rolling on the misfire chart because, you know, it's just it's just a bit, yeah, a bit difficult. But yeah, you could you could run a hell cannon uh, if you wanted some range. I prefer the chariots. Um, you could also put in some um, beastman units um, as allies. So, but I'm I'm not going down that route yet. Depends really what you end up facing, and then you start adjusting depending on what you struggle with, what you do well. You know, if you found that oh, actually this is happening all the time, what can I do about it? So that's kind of the fun with doing army lists. So I hope that was useful. But that's basically my first Chaos Warriors list that I'm going to run. Uh, I'm going to rebase these models, and that's going to be the first thing that I probably play a game with. Um, and just want to know what people's thoughts are. If you've got any cool combos on your Chaos Lord or Dragon, or you know you think the Demon Prince is better, and, and maybe the Demon Prince is better, saves more points, gets a second Wizard in, maybe upgrade that level two to a level four. But this is where you start getting into the the fun of army design so anyway i hope that gave you a good basis of how to go about writing army lists and if you were kind of thinking oh okay it's a bit daunting i'm not quite sure what to do um that app's really helpful it allows you just to do stuff on the fly i used to all buy pen and paper back in the day um i did have an excel spreadsheet at one point but <laughs> that was a long time ago yeah so hopefully um that allows you to now build your army lists up and um, put together your forces for your first game of the old world. Um, I'll try and get some more content out. It's been a bit hard to record now that work's back in full swing and I'm a bit away and stuff, so keep trying to get recording when I can. Um, I'm hoping that um, I can get the How to Play series done because it's something I do want to do. It's, it's just on the back of my mind, really, because it's a little bit more effort than doing these kind of shows. So hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did... Um, tell people about it, like, subscribe, do the algorithm stuff. If you haven't got your Arca site, please pick one up. It helps me out. Um, get other stuff from Pro Painted as well. There's lots of tokens. I'm sure he'll be doing movement trays um, in MDF, which are really good. So I would, you can contact him directly if you want specific things. Um, you know, just just email say I want this tray, this tray, this tray, and I'm sure he'll sort you out. Um, I'm planning to get movement trays made for this Chaos Army, and then once I've got those, I'll show you how I go about doing my movement trays and how I magnetize my models. And I'm also going to probably document how I rebase my warriors. Um, and also need to dust them off because they are covered in dust. So um, I'm going to show you how I did that, and that's going to be using an airbrush. Um, I did try using a dust can like you use for clean computers. It's a bit harsh, doesn't really work very well. So I'm going to, um, luckily they're varnished, so they, they've got some protection on. So I'm going to use airbrush thinner um, through the airbrush to try and uh, try and wash off the dust um, once I've given them a dry blow with the airbrush, so on high pressure. So I'm going to try that. Uh, it did it on a BSB model. It turned out quite well, so hopefully that's going to be my approach. I've not decided if I'm going to rebase them exactly the same because all my warriors were on slate with snow basing. Um, they are all metals and they're pins, so it's a little bit easier to rebase these, uh, and we'll see how it goes. But um, once I've got my bases for my pre-order, which I'm still waiting for, then um, I can crack on with that, and I'll, I'll try and document that as well to give people a few if you're a bit daunted about rebasing um it's really easy once you've done it a few times i did so much for aos it kind of just it's nice as well because it's very quick you do the base which is the fun bit and then you end up with an army really quickly so yeah i'm not a big i don't really care about rebasing i don't have an issue with it so yeah anyway thank you very much for watching hope you found that useful and um i'll catch you all in the next one see you guys bye